Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag, the old mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions here on this lovely and beautiful Sunday. Although we're recording this on Thursday, I'm just going <laughs> to trust it's a lovely and beautiful Sunday. Joining me uh, pretty regularly here is Mr. Josh McGuga. Josh. What's up, John? It's uh, it's lovely wherever you are, as long as you're watching us here on Collider Mailbag. That's yes, right. absolutely. And how do you get a question on Collider Mailbag? It's simple. Just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send and in those questions we take a bunch of mailbag questions monday through friday on movie talk but also all that's all we do here on the weekend so without any further ado let's get into it and the first question today comes to us from david howell who writes hello everyone uh what are your views on the embargo for critic reviews on the wonder woman movie only being lifted one to two days before the film comes out i know warner brothers has been burned by critics but is it yeah, but is this a good move to do this? The public could see this as a sign as the movie being no good. Um, well, okay. First of all, embargoes is not an unusual thing. There's usually embargoes in most movie reviews. Usually, though, the mo the studios do not hold the, re the embargo until a day or two before the movie. That mm -hmm. is usually a big red flag that the studio doesn't have faith in their movie. However... While it is true that the embargo for the Wonder Woman movie was the day before release, mm -hmm. they have moved it now to tomorrow. If you're watching this on Sunday, the review embargo lifts on Monday That's at huge. 9 p.m. Los Angeles time, midnight or, you know, Tuesday morning at midnight, if you will, East Coast time. So 9 p.m. Monday here in Los Angeles is when the embargo lifts, um, which I believe... They realize now they've got a pretty good movie on their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not allowed, they, uh, as of the recording of this, and as of when you're watching this, you're watching this, the embargo is not lifted yet. So I can't say much about the film. But what I will do is that they did allow me to, they did allow people to give a quick social media reaction. So I will read you my social media reaction because I was allowed to put that out there. So where is it? Um, here it is. Okay, this is what I wrote on Twitter. So I'm just telling you what I wrote on Twitter, word for word. Wonder Woman isn't a top 10 all-time comic book film, but it is a solid, enjoyable, well-written and directed film that I believe most people will enjoy a lot. So there you go. Warner Brothers seems to understand. What's your name again? Is it Veg? <laughs> Veg? <laughs> uh, there you go. Warner Brothers, I think they, they got it, that they had a pretty damn good movie on their hands. And I, and I think that gave them the confidence to move the embargo up to Monday. They believe that the word of mouth is going to be positive about this. So, yeah, normally having an embargo until the day before a movie comes out, that should be a giant red flag to everybody that this is a movie that even the studio doesn't I believe in. I think Fantastic Four, they held the embargo until a week after release. But, uh... Yeah, it, it was almost... They didn't even screen it for us <laughs> until the day before it opened. They didn't even screen it until the day before it opened. But anyway, uh, they, they're they screening Wonder Woman, though, because they, they screened it about a week and a half ago. I just saw it a couple of nights ago. I feel like I'm the only one who hasn't seen it. Yeah. Everybody on my Twitter and my Instagram, everybody has seen Wonder Woman. I have yet to see it. I'm a little bummed out, John. Yeah, so normally, yes, it's something to be worried about. But in this case... Warner Brothers moved it up, so no fears and there. And kind of a cool little marketing move, even if though if it wasn't intentional, uh, is they were going to hold it until two days before, and then they're like, yeah, we'll move it back, as, as like, hey, we really have faith in this movie. I don't know if that's something they did intentional. Regardless, you could think that that might be. I, I hope it wasn't intentional, because the initial message is, we, you weren't so sure if it was any good oh, or not. Oh, you like it? Yeah, right. Oh, wait, you like it? Now we'll oh. Yeah, no, um, yeah, but they've got to, again, reviews tomorrow, but like I said in my review, it is a solid, enjoyable film, and awesome. I think most people will enjoy it. Uh, for, once again, check back in on uh, Collider Video. Tomorrow, I will be putting up my review there, and you can see in it in all of its glory. Doing a big group review, doing a spoiler review, doing non-spoiler It's just going to be myself, non-spoiler. Myself, non-spoiler review. There we go. All right, the next question comes to us from Rafal Krolzitsk. Krolchik. Krolchik. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's like, that's a European NHL <laughs> name if I've ever read one. Yep. Since it's been a couple of months with the, since the passing of Zack Snyder's daughter, do you think Warner Brothers slash DC hired Joss Sweden to take over Justice League and in return as payment allowed him to make a DC film, i.e. Batgirl? Thanks and keep it up. Yeah, it... 
It was earlier this past this this week that uh, the news came out that back in March. It's amazing that they were able to hold that. Oh for two yeah, months. That's yeah, crazy. That uh, Zack Snyder's daughter had had uh, had passed away. She had committed suicide. Twenty years old. Such a tragedy. Um, and and it's understandable that some people and and they announced that Zack Snyder, who was not working on the film in March because mm-hmm. they had wrapped principal photography. They were just doing some post production stuff and they were getting ready to do their reshoots, which was always planned. They had always planned to do their their reshoots. They had scheduled them. It was all part of the plan. Um, So he wasn't working. And as they were getting closer to the time when he was going to go back and start doing the reshoots, Zach thought he was going to go back and do it. He thought it might be therapeutic for him to go back to work and lose himself in work. But he decided he can't do it. His family, I think he needs the time for himself. His family needs him. And he made a decision to step away. As a result, Joss Whedon, who is now in the Warner Brothers family, uh, so to speak. Joss Whedon was already working on writing a lot of the reshoots, mm-hmm. and I accidentally hit my chair level, <laughs> so I shrunk, suddenly shrunk a few inches. Um, Joss Whedon was already working on uh, some of the things, and so Warner Brothers turned to him to step in, to step back, to step into the director's chair for overseeing the post-production and for directing all the, uh, the pickup and the uh, reshoots that they're doing. I do not think for a second, because you got to understand timeline here. Yes, we only found out about a month ago about Joss Sweden entering. But the normal course of affairs is this, is when they announce that so-and-so has been cast in a movie, the reality is, is that decision was actually probably made two or three months before they announced it. Or at least have been in talks oh, yeah. for, a, for long, a long, long, long time. Long time. Yeah. Yes, they announced about a month ago that Joss Whedon was now plugged in and all this kind of stuff. But I am I can assure you probably, like I, I feel pretty certain that Joss Whedon had probably been on since you know, January or February, but they just didn't release that information to make it public until they were ready to do so. So no, I do not think that Warner Brothers going out and hiring and bringing on Joss Whedon had anything to do with the tragedy in Zack Snyder's family. I think that they had already was probably on board at that point, and it was just fortuitous for their particular circumstance that they had Whedon there to kind of step in and and fill Zack, uh, Zack Snyder's shoes while Zack Snyder steps aside and takes care of the vastly more important stuff, which is himself, his family, uh, and I think it was just like in, in within this terrible context, yeah. it was just fortuitous for them that they already had Joss there. Um, no, I agree 100 percent of all that. I, I think that, uh, you know, it's it's a tragedy what happened to Zack Snyder. And I think um, if they were to announce that that Joss Whedon was even involved in January, everybody would think that the, that the Justice League film was a mess. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, this yep. this happens with Zack Snyder. And uh, I mean, they the timeliness and the actual privacy that Zack Snyder was able to have some semblance of for as long as he did is absolutely shocking to me the way that the media works. Um, But uh, I think probably as a friend and as a, as a fellow filmmaker, I think Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon have had long, long conversations about what they both see for the film. Yeah. And look, I mentioned this on movie talk uh, this past week, but it it bears repeating here because you bring up like how amazing it was that this, all this was kept under wraps Mm -hmm. to me. There are often things that happen in this industry, uh, both on the film studio side and in the film journalism side that make me want to slam my head in, into the table. <laughs> but two things happened here that gave me a lot of faith. Number one, the class in which Warner Brothers handled this. They went to Zack Snyder and told Zack Snyder, hey, you know what? We'll push back the release date of Justice League. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's just a movie. It's just a release date. We'll push it back if you want. If you want to take more time, you take all the time you need and we'll push it back. And I thought that was very classy of them to do. I also thought it was very classy of Zach to go, you know what? No, I want you guys to move forward with it. We've put in a lot of work. You move forward. Professional. We, we got Joss Whedon here, for heaven's sakes. I, I feel confident I'm going to step aside and spend time with my family. So kudos, number one, yep. to, to Warner Brothers for the way they handled that. I think that was really class. The second thing that I got really impressed with, and I won't mention names, but I, even though I did not know about this, mm-hmm. I did not know the details, I know several people in the film journalism world did know about this. Oh, wow. And because they knew that it was the wishes of the Snyder family to not go public with it, in a world and in an age where everybody's, every single day, Three times a day, everybody's got to break the scoop. Right. 
these journalists, and there's probably more that I don't know about, who knew about this. I mean, if you're ever going to pl- apply the term hot scoop. Yeah. And they chose, you know what? Humanity is more important than the movie world. And they didn't run the story. Really cool. And I, I think that so right, everybody from the way Zack Snyder has handled this to the way that Warner Brothers has handled this to the way that the, even the film journalism community has handled this. It just makes me feel it's happy to know that some people can see beyond because we you know we talk a, a, about and i said this on movie talk too we operate in a very little box mm-hmm. and that is the world of film and entertainment and and television right and we'll get passionate and i know i do i'll get passionate and i'll get worked up and fired but ultimately we're only getting passionate worked up and fired about this little box of film and entertainment mm-hmm. real life is a lot bigger and it was really cool for me to see that when it comes down to real life a dude suffering the loss of a daughter and his family suffering that loss that that this industry from the movie makers themselves to the studios to the to the to the people that cover it we're all able to realize hey sometimes we need to step out of that box and understand there are bigger things at play here and for me, I, th- I thought that was really touching the way that everybody from Snyder all the way down handled this. I think uh, you, you hit on one word in particular, and that's the difference between a paparazzi and a journalist. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of paparazzi out there that would not even think twice about wanting to be the first person to break the news story that a filmmaker's daughter had committed suicide and that this was going to affect a film instead of looking at the human nature side of the business and saying these are actual people with actual lives and actual hearts and souls. And... This is an absolutely tragic thing. And so the fact that the people that were able to uh, practice some uh, some great restraint did, it, it kind of gives you a little bit of hope for the world. Yeah, and, and again, I can't say enough kudos to Warner Brothers yeah. for how they dealt with that absolutely. situation. Tough situation to deal with, and I thought they handled it with a lot of class. All right, the next question comes to us from Harry Green, who writes, Harry Green. <laughs> with hearing that a Scarface remake is in the works, I think it would be a mistake for the following reason. Scarface is more than about the story. It's about the Tony Monta- Montana. <laughs> Man. Hey. Mon- <laughs> he writes Montana. <laughs> he re- it's not my, look at the way it's written. Yeah, I got you. I got it. I got it's you. It's written got you. Tony Montana. Yeah. Um, character, Al Pacino's portrayal of Tony is on par with what Michael Douglas did in the Gor- with the Gordon Gecko character. Great show as always, guys. First of all, kudos to you for mentioning the Gordon Gecko. Yeah, one of the great performances of all time, Michael, Michael Douglas. D- his best. Yeah, bro. Yeah, actually, probably yeah, yeah. it is his best. And uh, yeah, I would agree with you. Al Pacino's role in Scarface on par with that. Iconic. Here would be my response. I'm, be- I'm dying to know yours, but here's mine. Okay. So what? Yeah. <laughs> So what that his performance was iconic? So what? What does that have to do with remaking it? Nothing. Look, it, it always comes down to this for me with remakes. What's the problem? They, re, you know what they did? They re, what was the Arnold Schwarzenegger remake they did with Colin uh, with Colin Farrell? Total Recall. Total Recall, right? They made Total Recall. I actually got a mild kick out of it, mm-hmm. and a lot of people hate it. That's cool. So the movie was a mess. Everybody hated it. That's fine. I haven't talked to anybody that said. Now I don't like the Arnold Schwarzenegger version. Right. Who cares? Yes, Pacino was brilliant in Scarface. So what? Scarface was also a remake. Scar- Al Pacino's Scarface was a remake. Yeah. Um, and again, so I asked, okay, it was great. What? Even if you say it's the greatest film of all time, so what? What does that change? If somebody else comes along and makes a movie uh, based, around, based on the same story and they give it the same title, does your Blu-ray of Scarface suddenly magically disappear off your shelf no like do you are you suddenly is now can nobody else watch that i can't even call it the original scarface because it's not can anybody else watch that al pacino version no it's so who cares there's two things that happens i think with remakes one is there's there's a section of people that are very 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 protective of their original franchises aka something like nothing Acoonies wrong with that yeah or something like that and and for me i am such a huge fan of gangster movies i'm not a huge scarface fan uh but I, I love gangster movies, and I think remakes have their place in certain things. There's there's two things that remakes do. They either create conversation of which one was better because they were two great movies, or it's not like the original guy, right? It's like our dads. Like, ah, you got to see the original Maltese Falcon, or you got to see the original uh, Magnificent Seven. All great movies. Uh, same with the original Scarface with uh, uh, James Cagney. Uh, and is it James Cagney? I didn't think it was no, Cagney, but I can't um, not James Cagney. Uh, 
Oh, it's the little. It's 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 Caesar. It's that it's that actor from the from the thirties and forties. Um, anyway. Anyway, move on. <laughs> regardless, uh, sc- making Paul re- Mooney. No, Are you sure? Yes, you're right. Paul Mooney. <laughs> Uh, my bad, but holy crap, Boris Karloff was in that film. Yes, I totally forgot that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway, anyway, so you have, but with, with with Scarface, which was over 35 years ago, you have an amazing chance to remake something that is still very, very relevant. Yes, the drug trade and in more Miami. Relevant or, today. I yeah. know cartels, whatever they do with it, it is a is a classic story, and you could remake that Scarface character as many times as you want, and still make awesome cinema. I'm I'm on board with it. And look, here's the thing. Like, I don't like people saying, I understand people want to be protective of their movies, but this isn't a situation like George Lucas changing up the Star Wars films. No. Like, if you want something to complain about, people who love the original trilogy, George Lucas comes out and does all these rounds of special editions and changed all this stuff in the Star Wars movies. The difference between Scarface and this is that those of us who love the original trilogy, we can't go out and find the original unaltered, undoctored, yep. unchanged version. It's gone. Now, if we were talking about Scarface the same way, yep. that they're remaking Scarface and the studio's going, you know what? We want this Scarface to be the definitive version of Scarface. And so we're pulling all the copies can't of the Al Pacino it. version off the shelf. Then you got something to complain about. Yep. But until that happens, until they change your beloved movies to the point that you can't go back and get the version that you love anymore, I don't want to hear you cry about it anymore. One more remake uh, that equal, if not better than the original, True Grit. True Grit. True Grit, I thought was better than the original. Great. I, I think John Carpenter's The Thing. Yes. Which was a remake, was better than the original. I agree. 100%. I think The the Fly was better than the original. I don't disagree. All I mean, great points. Yeah, so anyway. And great movies. All right, let's move on. Next question today comes to us from Ramundo, who writes, A bit of a different question today. During the AMC days, uh, you flirted with the idea of having a UFC show. That's Ultimate Fighting Championship Mixed Martial Arts. If that were ever to happen, what are the chances you will reach out to Joe Rogan to be a part of it? Maybe as a recurring guest. <laughs> you know what? These are some of my favorite questions. Like, I love getting tweets like, you know who you should have on TV talk? Tom Hanks. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely. Would love to have Tom Hanks. Um, I think... I know you, we, you would always talk about a UFC show. And we've, I mean, I would love to do a sports I wanna show. I want to do a UFC show so bad. I would love to have some sort of collider sports or a, a place where we could talk about sports as well. Because we do, I mean, we don't, aren't just TV and movies. We talk a ton about sports over here, too. Getting Joe Rogan as a recurring guest, I think there's a conflict there, uh, being that he's basically owned by the UFC and by Spike and whatever. I mean, every, anytime there's a UFC thing, Joe Rogan is on there. I'm sure he would come on as a guest at some point. Getting Joe Rogan is also difficult. Also, apparently Joe Rogan killed a mountain lion in the parking lot of the Ice House Comedy Club in Pasadena. <laughs> All of this makes for a hard person to track down in Joe Rogan. Hey, rem- okay, first, let's just with the Joe Rogan stuff alone. I've actually reached out to Joe Rogan because he's Joe Rogan apparently is also a big uh, movie Sh- Huge movie about. I'm a yeah. huge MMA guy, and I'm I'm a fan of Joe Rogan's, and I have reached out to him before to see if he wanted to come on and be on Movie Talk before, just because he is a film fanatic, mm-hmm. and um, this just driving the point home. In case any of you have any misunderstandings about this, I'm a fucking nobody. So like, <laughs> I reach out to Joe Rogan, and it's probably just one of a thousand tweets he gets a day from random fans, and yeah. he just kind of blows by it. Um, so it's, it's not like I haven't tried. Uh, the conflict of interest, even if even if Joe wanted to, I think there would be a little bit of conflict mm-hmm. of interest there for uh, the other thing. But it, it just reminds me, of, like sometimes we get people who've been mad at us. Like I remember we had um, uh, Chris Pratt in studio, right? Yeah. And that was great, and everybody was happy about it. But I get some of these fans who are like DC movie fans, because we had Chris Pratt in to talk about uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. How how come you don't have Henry Cavill in to talk about Superman? As if Henry Cavill's standing outside in Henry. downtown Burbank, knocking on her door saying, please let me in and be on Movie Talk, please. Oh, it's Henry. Like, it's Henry again. We can't let him be this just terrible. Just don't tell him I'm here. Jesus. Tell him I'm out. You know how hard it is to get stars and actors? Their schedules, one, are insane. Two, it's hard to even get them into junkets for their yeah. movie that they are contracted to do. Second, third of all, it's really even harder to get them to come to our studio, to sit at our desk for 15 minutes. they got to travel. They only have so many hours in a day. You guys, honestly, not to rant into a camera here, but it is really, really, really difficult to get A-list talent to come into studio. It's really difficult. Yeah, it's nigh impossible. Correct. So, like, so it's just it's when people get mad at me, 
you know, such and such a movie was coming out, and I, I don't know why you weren't fair to it by not having Julia Roberts come in and talk about it and let her promote the movie. Yeah, because they're they're all just waiting I, for our it, phone call to come in. Julia's and talk not to allowed us. in here. Julia is out. Okay, give me a friggin' break. It's yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It, <laughs> Again, it just reemphasizes at the end of the day, we are fucking nobody. It is really hard <laughs> to yes. get people here. Yes. All right. Let's move on to the next question. This one comes from Aqua Panther. Aqua Panther. <laughs> right. 70% I of the time. I think that's the Sex Panther. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, yeah. That's the other cologne it's of the, the Sex Panther collection. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, yes, it is. The hair product. Yes. Uh, extension of the yep. Sex Panther cologne. Yep. All right. It's been brought to, it's been brought up many times how uh, De Niro slash Bruce Willis, have been in their later years of their career and have seemingly just been phoning in their performances and or simply not being picky with their choices. My question is, besides De Niro and Bruce Willis, what other actors or actresses are wasting slash tainting away their career and legacy by doing the same? I say Johnny Depp. Thanks for taking my question and have a great day. Well, first of all, I don't know how you would throw Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp has been doing some high profile, like a lot of high profile yeah. projects. And to say that he's ever mailed it in, like what's that one where it's the uh, Black Mass? Oh, that's great. He was in, man. look, you, the so, movie stunk, but he yeah, was Yeah, say what you want about the movie. You could tell he was putting his all into that yep. character. Yep. I, I don't think you can include Johnny Depp in that category at all. As far as guys like De Niro, Pacino, who, uh, and Bruce Willis, guys like that, who I think they would be the first to tell you that, yeah, they, they've had films and whatever they've been involved in and, and they haven't, you know, done their best. Kevin Smith, if you want to, Kevin Smith has got an interesting story about him and Bruce Willis. Oh if, yeah. Yeah. So look, look, it's not a friendly relationship. So <laughs> if you want to look that up, look at Kevin Smith and Bruce Willis. Cause they did that one cop, uh, buddy cop movie together. Uh, the one with Tracy Morgan. Yes. The one with Tracy Morgan. Yeah. I cannot remember the name cop of it. Cop out. That's it. Yep. I'm glad I didn't remember the name of it, to be honest. Because <laughs> uh, it, it was a bad it film. It was not very good. Yes. Big Kevin Smith fan, but it, it was a bad film. Um, so here's I'm, here's the thing. I think what he means by Johnny Depp, he's, he's looking at uh, certain movies like Transcendence and Mort yeah, but, Dekai. But, 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 but in between but, but those. Transcendence, like, look at. Like we all thought that was going to be awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm sure on paper that looked like a great career move. Yeah. So it's not well, like in between that. What are, what are the other ones you're going to mention? Oh, he had Lone Ranger, but then you then you had Into the Woods, which is a really well received musical. Even though I can't stand musical, Alice Through the Looking Glass, not the best, but made a lot of money. But again, super major property, yep. well known property. Yep. Of course, yeah. It's and a good I mean, you're coming into The Invisible Man and Labyrinth, and that it's that which is not the remake of Labyrinth. It's the L.A. Cop movie. Uh, it's, I mean, then he, then he's in murder on the Orient Express upcoming Sherlock gnomes. I'm guessing he plays a gnome. I'm voice guessing it's gnome. probably gonna be an animated <laughs> voice. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Maybe, beast is that brought to us by the same people who did Gnomeo and Juliet? I believe probably yes. would be. Yeah. Um, but here's something else that we have to keep in mind. No matter how great and iconic actors like Robert De Niro and, and Al Pacino are, and even Bruce Willis as he's getting older, there aren't a lot of movies that are written these days with guys in their 70s in mind as the lead True. actor. Like, normally when the screenplays are written, they're not written with with lead guys who need to come in and sit. That's why you get movies like Last Vegas. I loved Last Vegas. Last Vegas was maybe, in, I, let's talk about vocabulary words, shocking how good it was to me. Yeah, because it was, it, I thought it was going to be an absolute train wreck. It was hysterically nice and charming. I I unabashedly, unashamedly love that movie. You're talking Morgan Freeman was Morgan great. Freeman, Robert De Niro, yeah. Kevin Klein, and Michael Douglas, yep. all in a movie together. Mm -hmm. Now, but that's one of these rare situations where a movie is written specifically for guys that age yeah. going there to do that. And these guys did. It. And seriously, folks, if you have not treated yourself <laughs> to Last Vegas, put it on DVD. It's a lot of fun. Have a couple beers. Enjoy Las Vegas. Yeah, but uh, but again, so you're talking about guys, and they're they're getting late in their careers. There's not a lot of roles. I mean, yeah. as much as you'd think, Robert De Niro, he could have any movie he wants. Really, they're not yeah. going to give Robert De Niro the lead role in Beauty and the Beast. They're right. not going to give you know they're they're not going to let uh, Al Pacino be Thor. And they're to not... those people that say like, oh, they've made enough money, why don't they just ride off in the sunset and not do crappy? Because they love what they do. Correct. They love. 
Yes, it's a paycheck. Yes, but they also really enjoy making movies. This is what they chose to do. My dad just retired at 68. Three days later, he was looking for another job because he was bored. Like, you just want to keep working. You want to keep busy. You want to do the thing. Let him make movies. If some of them suck, some of them suck. Hell, The Rock does some crappy movies, and he's not even 45 yet. I mean, you've got... Uh, you just you, listen, and if they're asking me, people that have have are mailing it in. I love Bruce Willis in Die Hard. I think Bruce, Bruce Willis lately has definitely been mailing it in a little bit. But that's Bruce Willis, and he can do whatever the hell he wants because you know what? He earned it. And you know what? I was talking to Michael Douglas, yeah, uh, about this very thing, and he and I was asking questions. You know what m- makes you decide to do a role like this, or a role like this, or a role like this? And he just gave one of the best answers ever. I've mentioned it on Movie Talk before. He just goes. He goes, by profession, I am an actor for hire. That's it. He said, why do you do those movies? Because they like, asked me. Why, if you're a plumber, why did you go and fix the pipes in that house? Because I'm a plumber. That's yep. what I do. Yep. Somebody come, I like I like plumbing. Somebody comes say, hey, I'm going to hire you and give you this money to come and do something you enjoy doing, fix, like fixing the, the, the inner workings of the waterworks of this house. And you go, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And Michael Douglas's attitude was the exact same. He goes, I am an actor for hire. You know, I heard Anthony Hopkins say basically the exact same thing before. It's like, like why would you do this Same movie, as Malcolm this McDowell. He told us that on the Schmoes. Yeah, yeah. it's because I'm an actor. And somebody wants to come along and hire me to be an actor in their film, then I'm going to go and do it and do it to the best of my ability. It was like dating my whole life. Why are you <laughs> dating that hot girl? Because she likes me. That's it. <laughs> That's because all I've there's got. a chance. Because I've got a chance. All right, let's move on to the next question. It comes off from Christopher Michael Woodburn, who writes, uh, who do you all think has been the best director of the 2000s? I love me some Christopher Nolan. Yeah, I don't know. Like, um, what do you think? <sighs> I don't know. Because, you know, I got to tell you, I actually do think... Christopher Nolan is the answer, because uh, not greatest of all time. Greatest of all time, that uh, that title belongs to uh, I, Steven Spielberg to me. But in just the two thousands, okay, Christopher Nolan has made oh gosh, he's made eight films already, mm-hmm. with the ninth one on the way, and none of them have been bad films. No, he, this is what he's done and since two thousand. On the way in two thousand, Christopher Nolan did Memento. In 2002, he did maybe my favorite film of his, Insomnia. In 2005, he did Batman Begins. In 2006, he did The Prestige. In 2008, he did The Dark Knight, which is most people's favorite film Mm -hmm. of his. In 2010, he did Inception. In 2012, he did The Dark Knight Rises. In 2014, he he did Interstellar. And now he's got Dunkirk. I think his worst film on that list is Interstellar. And that's a good movie. Yeah, and... (laughs) Christopher Nolan is the dude. Maybe Christopher Nolan or... I don't... I mean, like, if there's somebody you're like, God, I can't wait for them to do my movie. If, like, you had your dream director right now to do your movie, everybody would want Christopher Nolan to step on, just like they would, like, if they had a lead in a movie, like, ooh, could I get my script to Daniel Day-Lewis? Well, right? yeah, as an actor, yes. Right, I'm, yeah, so that's what I'm sure, saying. Yeah. Like, Daniel Day-Lewis is the Christopher Nolan of acting and vice versa. I, I, can't, I, I can't pick a better storyteller out there right now. Yeah, I mean, I, de- I guess you could definitely say um, Quentin Tarantino is another name that would have to be up there. But I think the 2000s have probably belonged to uh, to 100%. Christopher Nolan. That's a pretty good one. Yep. All right, guys, that'll do it for this weekend's installments of Mailbag. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank my, my co-host again today. <laughs> blah, 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 I'm just tripping all over the place. Mr. Josh McCuga. Josh, where can people find you online? Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Josh McCuga. Collider TV talk here every Monday. Again, we're off tomorrow uh, for Memorial Day, but we'll be back Monday, the first Monday in June there. Uh, Check us out, David Griffin, myself, Emma Fife, Sinead DeFries. And, of course, you can find me uh, on Movie Talk Monday through Thursday on Mailbags here. Once in a while, I find my Jedi Council or Heroes or Mailbags. And, yeah, I'm all over the place over here. <laughs> and you can follow me on social media, on Facebook, and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys, for this weekend of uh, Mailbags. Once again, as Josh has pointed out, no Movie Talk tomorrow on Monday because we are taking the holiday off. We hope you guys have a wonderful time spending it with friends and family and uh, maybe a good movie. That would be a good thing to do, too. So that'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us. Until next weekend, bye-bye.